I'm talking to Jerry McQuaid. Jerry has held executive board positions with BT, EE, Orange and Virgin, and he has more than 30 years experience in consumer and business to business technology. He was a founding director of Virgin Mobile and part of the team that took it from conception to flotation and eventual sale. Most recently, Jerry spent more than 12 years at EE and then BT, initially joining as the chief executive of their wholesale and ventures business, and subsequently running their combined enterprise business. He's also worked in small enterprises and startups, and is currently chair of Forensic Analytics, an industry-leading software training and consultancy business. Welcome to the business of being brilliant, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. So you've, you've obviously spent most of your career in the telecoms industry. Have you ever been tempted to divert into another industry? Well, it's, uh, no, I haven't in short. Uh, I, I got into telco uh, in very early 90s um, and I'd been in consultancy and I had worked in, I suppose, in consulting lots of different industries, worked in banking, manufacturing, retail, and uh, in a sense, although they're very modern these days, it felt as if they were 18th you know, century in- industries. And I came into mobile and I did a job at what is now O2 to launch the first consumer tariff um, way back in the early 90s. And I realized that this was going to be something very, very different from anything that I'd seen before. And, and as I always often say to people, I thought this is going to change the world. So I, I jumped on it with no real idea of how it would change the world, but it's just been such a dynamic ride that I've never really been tempted to go into another industry because uh, it's always changed. It's always fulfilled me in terms of challenges and direction. So yeah, I've never really been tempted. Yeah, I can understand that. It being such a, a, an industry with where we've seen such massive acceleration in developments and, and innovation. And, and I love your ethos of, you know, your intuition that I'm in for an interesting ride. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm up for it. I think that's a really great way to approach, you know, a career, just kind of see where it takes you and and enjoy the ride. Yeah, I mean, I think I've I've always said to people, I love change. Uh, uh, Not not so much if someone else is imposing it on me, but actually the the notion of change, I do think it's... uh, at what it's what keeps things exciting and uh, and and constantly challenges you. So I mean, I think seeing an industry change is uh, is just a joy actually to be part of it. Yeah, yeah. So for people listening now, they've got a sense of the roles you've had and and what attracted you to the industry. Um, can you give them a sense of who you are as a person? What what three words would you choose to describe yourself, or or might others use to describe you? Um, that's a good question, actually. I think in a business sense, I think people would say um, I'm pragmatic. I use, I get that uh, desc- description. Uh, I'm very commercial. Uh, as another description I hear a lot about me. I, um, and I think the other thing that I, I'm aware of myself is I'm dyslexic. And I think that that does define a lot of the things that probably make me who I am, uh, and I'm not severely dyslexic, uh, but uh, I certainly struggled with certain, certain things, and and I think as a result, you know, people with that experience think differently, and uh, so that those are the three things that I think, in terms of a work environment, uh, people would often use, you know, certainly the first two they'd use, and the third is one I'd use for myself to see why I think differently. Yes, and. Can you tell me a bit more about that, about how it's helped you to approach your work differently? I don't, it's not a rational thing. It's not something that, for me, it's different. It's just the way I look at things. And I often get, you know, people will say to me, you know, you, you look at the world a bit upside down. And, you know, and I've noticed that with other people working in Virtue, and you can see that the, my, my CEO in Virtue is very dyslexic. And then Branson's dyslexic. And you do see that, you know, people will often come to you and say, look, here's what we want to do. And here's the rationale for it. It goes A, B, C, D. So therefore, E and F comes next. And I think quite often, you know, people who are dyslexic will actually don't 
think like that. Their brain is just wired differently. They go, what if you turn it the other way around? What if you look at it in a different way? And I, no, I, I don't think of it as a different way. I just think of it as the way my brain works. And I think it's just that diversity of thought. And it's not, I don't think there's anything special about being dyslexic. It's just another diverse way of thinking. And I think, I mean, I've, I've always believed that, you know, businesses are better when it gets more diversity of every kind, you know. Yes. Uh, and diversity of thought is actually something and experience, something that really enhances the dialogue. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree. And I think as looking at organizations, a lot of them have worked very hard on understanding the things that help promote better gender diversity and trying to put some of those in place and to a slightly lesser extent around racial diversity. And there's a bit more talk nowadays about, you know, social diversity as well. And you know, all these different aspects of diversity, but I think sometimes the one perhaps we talk less about in concrete terms and openly is around, as you're saying, you know, different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at problems, you know, embracing yeah. that diversity of thought. I, I first encountered that actually when I was, uh, what is, it was at Cellnet, what off to, and it was a business that was really just growing. And we they got everybody it wasn't a massive business at the time but we got everybody to do miles briggs and i can't remember the exact number but there was a, an incredible percentage of people were istjs and it was just everybody was recruiting in their own likeness uh, and if they weren't istjs they were very close to it and we ended up with this sort of homogenous group of people who all sort of thought the same way and acted the same way and we're just we're just recruiting the road, and actually that's the first time it struck me actually about actually there's another way of doing it. Mm. Yeah. So for those listeners who haven't come across MBTI, it's a personality traits profiling tool, widely used in business, and just helps you to understand your preferred way of operating. So that there's no right yeah. or wrongs, are there? But but fascinating that so many of you ended up with one out of the 16 <laughs> profiles yeah. that you can get definitely cause for alarm on the diversity front. Um, and it, in terms of the different businesses you've worked in and the roles you've played, you've obviously got a, a huge range of experience with companies of all different sizes and taking companies through flotations and merger integrations and sales. Looking back, when would you say you really flourished most in your career? Was there a particular time or was it more certain things had to be in place for you to feel like you were really flying in your work life? I think things that obviously is success or growth in a business or, you know, the, you know, the external factors when they're working, you know, it, it's always easy to feel as if you're comfortable and you're, and it's, in, it's enjoyable. But I think the things that I think give the sort of level of personal satisfaction as well as enjoyment and flourishing is I think it's when I've always been given a step up uh, in terms of challenge not necessarily a step up in role, but a step up in challenge where suddenly you've had to deal with problems that force you to think differently about how you manage and how you lead and the breadth of things that you've got to cover. Um, I think when that works, I think that's when I really feel, I felt when I look back on it, that, you know, I flourish not just in terms of the sort of external factors of success, but actually feeling as if I've grown and actually I'm a more rounded leader than I would have been before. And uh, and it really needs that level of stretch to make you think, whether it's scale or it's just, you know, maybe a financial challenge that in the market this is becoming very problematic about how you work around it, what the strategy is. Those things quite often, they force you to be just a different leader. You just have to find new tools in your toolbox. And uh, uh, and when those have happened uh, and they've been successful, I feel as if that's where I've taken um, not just the most comfort, but more confidence about what else I can do. So it sounds like real professional growth, but also personal growth as well. And, oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I think what I heard you allude to was – that you, when faced with a, a challenging, you know, goal or task or something that's going to stretch you skill-wise or or knowledge-wise, it sounded like you take time 
to reflect on what you need to do differently or what you how you need to lead differently or what people you might need to draw it sounds like there's quite a bit of reflecting in there as well yeah, I think I'm quite reflective, but also I, I mean, I do think you can learn a lot from people and I've, I, you know, I've, I've been blessed with, you know, I've, especially the CEOs I've worked for, I've always tried to get close to them and understand them. And they've all been very, very different. Um, when I look at the, the, the people I've worked for as CEOs, they, they're, you know, the, the spectrum is enormous about, you know, where their skills were and what, what they were good at and what they weren't good at. And, but there isn't any of them that I haven't learned an enormous amount from. Uh, and I've always, and I've been very comfortable speaking to them, like, how did, when you had to address this, how do you look at it? How do, and, uh, you know, I don't mind stealing and plagiarizing other people's ideas. But yeah, I think you have to reflect on, you know, I think that's the right thing to do is stop and question yourself and say, does this work? And, um, you know, uh, probably the, the, the area where the biggest challenge for me is when I first picked up a P&L. And the first P&L I picked up was £2 billion. And it, the gap between what I'd have been doing, I'd mean, been dealing with big issues and you know and in big companies, but suddenly you're in a market-facing role with a lot more dynamics associated. And, and I, I had no shame in talking to my CEO and said, like, how did you deal with this? What was your... Thinking and give me a very simple piece of advice. Actually, he said, "Like, don't think you can manage the people in the same way as you did before, because all of a sudden you've got a, a breadth that you've never had before in terms of the nature of the issues and what you need to make sure is happening." So, use the numbers. You have to get close to your numbers, and it doesn't mean just the financial numbers, but use. And and that was a it was a very salutary lesson actually, because whilst I've always been comfortable with numbers, I've never quite used them the way he had used them. And it's a simple tool, but actually it saved me so much effort and it did make me think very differently about what I needed to do with my time and, and how I interacted with my people. And, um, but it's, it is, it's, it's just a small example of just thinking differently about how you manage. Yeah. That's really fascinating to hear. And I love the way you kind of look at the CEOs uh, and other executives you work with and think, well, what can I learn from them? You know, we all have different leaders, different bosses, and some relationships come more naturally than others. But I love that very open, curious, you know, learning mindset. Well, each each one of them is going to teach me something if I'm open to it, if I ask the right questions. So what can I learn from them? I love love that attitude. It's a great, and it's a great piece of advice they shared with you. So when you were faced with a challenge like that, or something that felt daunting, or perhaps something when a time when you know, conditions for you at work in whatever way felt difficult, you know, what, what, how do you respond? How have you responded to that, and what did you take from the experience? Um, I've actually always lent into those sort of things. I think I've been comfortable um, in that chance. One of the, one of the lessons I think I learned quite early is that when things are successful, it's not all about you, and when things go badly, it's not all about you. And and as a result, I don't. I, as I say, I'm quite pragmatic about it. And I think when you get a challenge and things are really tough, um, you can't run away from it. So you've got to lean into it and you've got to, and and I think you've got to use all the tools that are available to you. And by that, I mean, usually it's about people. You know, I, I don't think, you know, most businesses are pretty clear on the strategy. The market's it's not changing dramatically day by day. So it, it's uh, it's usually about, how you execute things and how you support people to do the execution they need. I think I do believe in strategy and the execution of strategy as a fundamental element of running a good business. Mm -hmm. Don't just look at the short term, make sure that you've got a sort of 50,000 foot and a, and a 50 foot view of your business so that you can make sure you're kind of heading in the right direction, but you know what's the issues in the short term. And it's just lots of, I think you've got to have lots of small things that you're achieving uh, and looking at uh, when when things are challenging and make sure that you're... The, the thing that I think probably came late to me is actually recognising that 
if you have a challenge, that challenge is shared by the rest of your team and making sure that you're thinking about whether they've got the same mindset in dealing with that challenge. And I, I was probably slow in a few times in the last 10 years or so, sometimes not seeing that some people were really struggling emotionally or mentally with the challenge that I was like, don't worry about it. You're a very capable person, really happy where you go. Don't worry about the numbers. They're going to get better. But that's not where they were. So I think being, it's not just about, you know, making sure they've got the right demands, that they know what they need to do. But actually, I think that, you know, you do also need to make sure they're comfortable in the space that they've been, they're having to operate in. Because when you have something challenging, as a leader at any level, you know, your people are sharing in that challenge. Yes. Um, and the last thing I'd say on it is that I think it's it's really important as a leader that you don't share the problem, that, you know, you, you, sh- you share the confidence that the problem is doable. You know, you walk out of your office if you have an office or you walk on the office floor, you've got your look confident and you've got to talk as if you're confident because – you know, people are relying on you to say this is the right approach to deal with the issue um, as a team. Yeah. Um, That's so interesting to hear. And as I've been talking with other podcast guests, one thing that keeps coming up when I ask people about when they flourished in their career is that they were asked to step up to a challenge in some way, take on, you know, a challenging piece of work or a new responsibility or a new role. But the thing that made the difference was having their manager or someone senior who really believed they could do it. And I'm hearing you describe, you know, the, the manager's perspective on that, which is you, you might not have all the answers. You might this might be a challenge that's keeping you awake at night. But what you're doing is going out and saying to people, I've got confidence in you that together, you know, we can figure this out or that you can play your part in this. Yeah, I mean it's it's a team game. I mean business is a team game, and I think it's uh, it's essential that you're giving people both space, but and you know there's there's always a dynamic of trying to push them as hard as you can, but you've got to do that in a way that is actually about saying you can go further because you're capable of going further, and you've got the support to go there, and you know and. And if it doesn't all come off, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, uh, you know, nothing always works, you know, uh, completely as you expect. So don't worry if it doesn't. And I think you just got to give people the space. It's not about failing. It's just, you know, that it's not about always being 100%. And uh, I, I think that, you know, if you don't do that, you know, people need uh, that support, but they also need the affirmation. Um, I think we all do, even if we say we don't. We all nobody nobody gets upset when someone says you've done a great job, you know. It's, uh, uh, and I think we all, you know, we all value it, and yeah. uh, and we give more for it if we if we are valued. Yeah, yeah, and often it's not it's not said enough. And you're right, even if someone seems highly capable and and doesn't seem to need the positive affirmation, it doesn't mean they don't appreciate it, and it it hasn't you know encouraged them on so moving on to talk a little bit more about uh, work cultures and in my business book the future of time i write about how we have certain cultural norms at work in relation to the way we think about time the way we manage our time and how we spend it how we value it and a lot of that is characterized by very high speed always on a high degree of urgency, everyone frantically busy, but also lots of multiple communication channels, quite fragmented working days, the way we're always hopping from one task to another or one conversation to another, a lot of juggling. And that can be difficult for the individual to thrive and do productive work and and feel like they have a sustainable work life. And it can be problematic for businesses as well, who may be struggling with lots of long hours of working, but lower productivity, lower well-being, um, and actually making slow progress towards their diversity and inclusion goals. Um, Is these, these time norms, these habits, are they things that you've perceived and experienced particularly 
as a leader, I'm interested in how you've observed that at play in organisations where you've been in a leadership role. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's becoming an even stronger dynamic. Even when I was younger in consultancy, there was a you know, it was a, the dynamic of a very macho culture. As you know, we were on pro, you know maybe in a, a project and abroad, and you know we'd expect to be in at the crack of dawn, and you know you were not expected to leave until you know quite late in the evening. And that, the mindset was you know was was it was a necessity to get the work done, but at the same time. Uh, you know, it created all sorts of poor dynamics within the workplace. And I think we're seeing, you know, technology, as you say, shifting the dynamic of what work looks like and the immediacy of of people's expectations for, uh, you know, when questions are raised. And and I thought also, um, I, I don't know what quite the answer is here. I mean, we did a we did a, a piece of research probably about three or four years ago for gra- on graduates that we were hiring. And it was uh, it was interesting to see their mindset. It was and there was quite a spectrum, but there was quite a lot of people saying, "Look, I live my life digitally, and I do what I need to do when I need to do it, and I do it digitally." You know, I speak to my friends, and if it's you know if it's twelve o'clock at night, you know we still have a conversation, and and if you need me to do work, I'm happy to do it any time, but I expect you to be flexible. So if I need to do something in the morning. And I'm going to do all my work in the evening. If that doesn't impinge on things, why should that be an issue? And definitely a reasonable question, actually. Um, but of course, there's other work dynamics that need you to be in and, and collaborate. And I, I think that that evolution of you know the way people you know millennials probably think is very different to the way most leaders are thinking. And I think it will drive. A lot more change of flexibility, and it's already happening. And actually, some of it was quite poor through COVID. What we saw in our business was that people's commute time became work time. You know, and people they thought there was a presenteeism required, so they sat by their computer or on their computer for ridiculous amounts of the day. And you know, we didn't have a product productivity problem through COVID. We had the opposite problem. We had people working too long. And uh, we're trying to tell people that, you know, if you want to take a break, you know, for half an hour in the morning, once you've been, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, but people feel obliged to be in, connected in the business and look as if they're busy. And I think, you, you know, I, I've always felt the need, you know, we need to make sure people know that we understand the need for a work-life balance. Um, I actually do tend to the view that actually, we need the business and the employee in this world to be more flexible. So the idea of everything being a nine to five or a fixed set of hours is very difficult in a world where we're becoming more global. We, you know, customers and 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 uh, suppliers and whoever in different time zones they all have different implications for how we run the business. Um, you know, I think when a business how you operate as a leader when people have difficult demands and we all have demands where our Private life is going to impinge on business, and I've always felt the view that you know you've got to treat someone to, in the realization that family will always come first, and therefore, if someone says I need to take my child to here for the mo- tomorrow morning, can I have some time off? The smart answer is always to say yes, unless you know, say unless you know unless there's some major problem you're going to tell me about. Of course, you can take the time off, um, because actually they'll give you it back in space. They know that, that you know that you're actually you know, you're recognising their needs and they're going to recognise your needs. And, you know, but I do think the dynamic of technology is the one that is going to shift and continue to shift the way that we, you know, need more flexibility and uh, from both businesses and staff. And I don't know quite how the contracts work on that, but, uh, yeah, you see it, you know, all the time. And... What you try in terms of how you deal with it, I think it's just trying to be personable and sensible and recognise that you know the business isn't isn't everything in people's lives. You know, it's it's a means to an end for most people. It's not an end in itself. Yeah. So. Yes, and so I see some organisations leaping quite quickly to figure out, often quite collaboratively with employees, you know, what their new 
working policies are going to be, working arrangements, and to announce that. Uh, and I see other organizations still sticking with a period of experimentation, you know, sometimes saying, well, let's just see how we all individually make it work at, at our team levels over the next year. And then, you know, we'll review it again and see. W- where are you on that spectrum? Uh, I think manager discretion can work quite well, but it also can be a bit of an issue when you get different views. And uh, and actually, this is true. I mean, it, you know, as you mentioned at the start, I'm the chair of a very small tech company and, you know, having worked in very large businesses, the same issues arise. You know, we've been in, in the board of, uh, you know, forensic analytics, which I chair, we've had the exact same discussions. You know, do we make this policy? And we can see the dangers of that being a policy. And then we say, well, we do want to lean into this. Um, how do we make it manager's uh, discretion? And then you've got different managers around the table saying, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work for my team. And it, others saying, well, I'd like to do it. And so I, I, I think you need to just be open to the ideas and then see how you can take small steps if you have to, if you're worried about the implications. But uh, and, and see whether you can find solutions by doing steps, you know, small steps. Those are not easy tasks. And uh, every business, every business struggles with, you know, how do we lean in to make sure our staff has as much flexibility as we can give them, um, whilst at the same time not damaging the business that would then, and as a result, everybody's impacted. So, yeah, yeah it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah. It's interesting to hear how, you know, how you're approaching that in in your in your current organization is there a future ambition that you haven't yet achieved that were we to be talking five ten years time you'd love to be telling me about i I don't have a personal ambition for future i mean the uh, i i love the business the reason i've taken this business i think it's it's a very purposeful business the people who are in it um are fascinating and, and just fantastic people. And I love working with them. So my ambition is purely one of, you know, it's a business that's you know tiny, it's got three million of revenue, and it can grow very fast. It's in a, it's in a super position. Okay? And you know, just making that successful for the guys. They've worked for eight years on this idea, taking they've never taken funding until now. They've worked for next to nothing to make this happen. And it's just a joy to try and help them be part of it, to help them be successful. And they deliver a product which is actually really meaningful uh, in society. It really has an impact. And so that's the ambition I have is how to help them be successful. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of great things that you could recommend that would be useful to people listening. But is there a particular resource whether that's a book or um, a talk or uh, just a piece of advice, um, you know, that you that's really helped you in your work life and your career that might be helpful to people listening? Is there one you could share? There's probably, it's probably two things. I've never, I've never been, I suppose when I say pragmatic at the start, it's, I'm not that theoretical. So when I have read, and, and I do read business books, I, I often find them difficult to, really be deeply meaningful. There's two that I think has been, one is really just a, um, a simplification of Branson's philosophy, which is, a, um, it just really tries to, in sort of 10 steps of what are the sort of key philosophies, and philosophy is probably a big word um, for this, that Branson applies, or the brand of Virgin tries to apply to the businesses. Um, and I think when I was in Virgin, it was about 200 businesses. So it wasn't richer. It was just the brand values were the things that were in there. And the really simple things about, you know, everybody talks about being customer first. I mean, the, the, the notion they had, which I actually love, is that look after your staff. Because if you look after your staff, they'll look after the customer. If they look after the customer, the customer will look after your balance sheet. And uh, the and, and it really... It really permeated the business. So there's a there's a book which I said I, I made sure I could have never remember this guy's name. A guy called Des Dearlove, and it's about um, calls it the Richard Branson way. But it really is a very simple book, 
Um, and that's one which actually, actually I do think there's lots of really simple ideas in there that you know they're worth thinking about when you're when you're, when you're in business. And the other one was a book that um, I had a CEO who arrived um, uh, when I was uh, at what became EE at Orange, and the CEO came out and he had a big reputation. Uh, it was you know uh, he, he liked changing the organisation and driving very hard. And he arrived on day one, and everybody was a little bit um, unsure of what was going to happen uh, with a new CEO. And he gave everybody a book called Execution, which scared the life out of everybody. Um, they thought it related to them. And, uh, <laughs> what is he trying to tell you know, us? It's a book, it's a book uh, by a couple of consultants called Execution, The Discipline of Getting Things Done. And again, it's, it's not a highly theoretical book. It's a very practical book about, and basically it says, you know, businesses don't fail in their promise because of the market or because of the strategy. Because business leaders typically know what's going on in the market and they typically are pretty sound in the strategy. It's execution that fails them. And it's about understanding why businesses fail to deliver what they promise. And I think actually it's, it's a nice, simple book about recognizing that just be, suppose just because you say it doesn't mean you say it's going to get done as a leader. And actually, you need to take actions to think about, you know, how am I going to ensure that this actually gets done yeah. in a way that really enables the rest of the strategy. Yeah. And I, and actually, it's a book that actually I, I did take a lot from in terms of just, you know, just a sensible way to think about leading change in your business. Yeah. Thank you for those two recommendations. They both sound fantastic and quite complementary and sounds like actually you could use them. They might be of benefit to you, whether you're running your own business or running a small business or running, you know, in a big role in, in a big business as well. And how can listeners connect with you if they want to connect with you professionally after listening to the podcast? What's the best way to, to do that? I suppose LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I'm pretty easy to find. I don't think there's many Jeremy Quaid's on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay, great. And, uh, uh, and there's a picture of me on LinkedIn as well, so you can, you can see it's me. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry, for giving us your time and talking about your career and the different roles you've had and kind of what's top of been top of mind for you as a leader and how you've gone about leading the organisations you, you've been responsible for. It's been really fascinating to hear, and I'm sure listeners will have picked up so many great pieces of advice and, and bits of wisdom so thank you for sharing those my pleasure thank you very much <laughs>